What's up guys? Welcome. This is the first episode of Create a Life You Love. Now I thought I'd start things off just by kind of introducing myself and explaining to you why I created this podcast. So my name is Jeremy and over the last seven, eight years, I've been going on a self-development and spiritual journey where I was really doing a lot of work on myself. And through that, I've been able to kind of transform myself in a multiple of different ways through doing a lot of inner work and you know using a lot of different modalities joining groups masterminds going to events retreats workshops everything you could think of and over the last kind of year or so i really wanted to kind of give back in a way that would help other people so i started supporting other people and i started kind of creating my own groups and throughout all these experiences I connected with Giovanni and Giovanni is the founder of Elemental Wellness and Elemental Rhythm and a couple other businesses as well. But I started working with Gio at Elemental Rhythm and Elemental Rhythm is a breathwork kind of transformational um, company. So through our relationship at Elemental Rhythm and my own experiences, we came together to create, uh, create a life you love. And the program itself is designed to kind of help people in their own journey. And let's just say you're lost or you're stuck and you're looking, you know, to get yourself back on track and you're trying to figure out what's kind of holding you back or what's blocking you. You know, we created this program as a container for you to come in and do that inner work. so you don't have to do it alone. We've created a whole journey for you guys that will basically take you, you know, through your transformation. So to go along with that, I thought it would be a good idea to create a podcast where I could interview other people that have been on transformational journeys and have used these types of modalities to really transform their lives. So I decided to put this podcast together and over the next 10 to 12 episodes or so, we'll be trying to post uh, once a week. I'll be interviewing people who have been on these journeys and getting you know their stories. So in this first episode, Gio is going to interview me and I'm going to share my story with you guys. And I'm going to take you on my journey where I, like I said, went through my own kind of transformation. So I hope you guys are interested and I hope you enjoy this episode. And, you know, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Music, all the major uh, platforms where you can listen to podcasts. So please subscribe if you enjoy this episode and you want to hear more. And there'll be some more information below in the description if you want to learn more about the program, Create a Life You Love, or sometimes we call it Create a Life You Love to Live, because that's really what this all is about. So thank you guys so much. I have a ton of gratitude for anyone that's watching this right now, and I hope you get a lot out of this episode. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Gio here, guest host today, um, for obviously a special reason, because I'm going to be interviewing Jeremy, who is the, the regular host of Create Life You Love to Live podcast. Welcome, Jeremy. Hello, hello. What's going on, guys? Yeah, I'm doing great. I hope everyone listening is doing great as well. I'll just maybe do a quick intro. Um, you know, I met Jeremy quite a few years ago. He walked into Elemental and was curious about breathwork. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure where he was at, but he just came in like, looked like he was looking for something, a change or a community or just some curiosity was sparked and found him there. And we'd become friends of the years. He had joined a men's group that we were part of. And, you know, we were just kind of kept crossing paths until this last year, you know, I was looking for some help at Elemental Rhythm. And a mutual friend of ours, Mark, who actually is one of the music producers at Elemental Rhythm, was like, hey, you got to talk to Jeremy. I think he's, he's looking for something. I think it's going to be a great fit. And so we hopped on a call and and uh, immediately kind of just like hit it off and just uh, I got really excited. I think Jeremy is the same as well about the potential of working together. And many things happened and he made a huge impact right away. But one of the things that kind of came out of it was creating this this ecosystem called Create a Life You Love to Live, which is I don't know what you want to call it a platform, a program, a community of people who are going through um, change and going through maybe a transition in their life or a moment of awareness or a low point or something where something inside of them is like, hey, there's something more. And how do I get to, you know, maybe not even where I want to go, but how do I get to like 
a life that may not even seem possible right now. And, and, you know, that kind of came from a lot of stories of people who are in a similar place that started going through a transformation like myself and Jeremy as well, and that we're still going through and we're still kind of like diving deeper into, you know, what can we create? Like what kind of life can we really create for ourselves? Um, that's in alignment with who we are, that makes us feel fulfilled and happy and in the moment and all of these things. And so, you know, when he said, hey, we should, we should create something as a collaboration and make a podcast. So yeah, like that sounds amazing. And I could see how fired up he was about it. Something was ignited within him. So create this podcast, you know, he's interviewed me. I'm going to interview him. Now, just to share a bit about who we are, um, you know, as you, you may be deciding to embark on a journey with us or just curious to learn more, maybe to be inspired for your own, you know, um, journey of development and transformation. So welcome, Jeremy. And yeah, I, I'd love to start sharing with people just a bit about who you are, maybe a bit about your journey and how you got to... To, to where you are right now in this, this program we've been creating. And I guess maybe the journey along the way to even want to do something like this. So you can start wherever you feel is relevant, but yeah, tell us a bit about you and maybe where you were before and how you got to where, where you are right now. Yeah, no problem. I think that was a great segue. First of all, you explained it really well. And um, this whole notion of creating a program or creating a life you love has definitely been something I think I've been connected to for a very long time. And, you know, my, my journey started, you know, when I, when I was a young kid, I was always taught that, you know, success is very relevant to the school you go to and then the job that you get and the amount of money that you make and the house that you buy and the vacations that you go on, the clothes that you wear. And this was my interpretation anyways. I don't know if my parents were purposely trying to instill this in me. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think it's even relevant, but growing up, this is what I saw. And the older that I got, the more in the other direction I was trying to go. I was the youngest of three, three boys, two older brothers. And I was, I guess you could say I was more the rebellious one. I like to do things my own way, do things my own path. And as I got older, I became more and more rebellious. You know, I, I grew up in a Jewish family and there was a lot of kind of contradictions until like my parents saying one thing and doing another. And here I am as a kid seeing all this stuff and like, I got to a certain point where I think that I just kind of like had enough of it. Like I could see that everything just felt like it was a show, like everything was just put on for a certain type of image, you know, we were trying to portray and I just wasn't aligned with it. So when I got to the point where, I don't know, I was like 18 years old and I met a girl. And when I met this girl, she was like the complete opposite of like the life that I was living. Like she came from different part of Toronto. She lived in Scarborough. A lot of the stuff isn't too relevant, but it's just, it was something that was so like different than what I was used to. I was so attracted to it. And so when I met this girl, it was, and the reason why I even bring this up is because it was like a big kind of transition in my life where a lot of things changed after that. Up to that point, you know, again, I was the youngest of three. I was going to school. I was going getting older i was going out with my friends i was like experimented a lot actually with mushrooms i was doing a lot of things outside the box that my parents were normally used to and when i met this girl everything kind of shifted from that moment forward it was like i got into this relationship and what happened was over time i ended up basically leaving home i ended up moving in with her she was living in her parents basement and through that relationship i ended up having no connection with my family, no connection with my friends. I basically shut everything and every, everyone out that I knew from, from, from my life. And I was just like, okay, now this is my new life for whatever reason. I was like living with this woman. And again, it just shifted everything. I, I was lost in a certain respect. And I think she found me at a time where she could really have a lot of influence on me. And I think that's kind of looking back on it, that's what happened. And through that relationship, you know, I was looking back on it now, I feel like I was very emotionally kind of abused, like almost to the point where she had control over me and what I did, the people that I would talk to, hence the fact that I had no connection with my family and my friends. And this whole time, like you can imagine the impact that would have on my parents more so my mom than anyone. And some of my friends too, they were trying to like come to the house. They were trying to get me out of there. And I was like, no, no, I'm good. I'm going to stay here. This is 
I thought it was, I was in the perfect scenario and in the moment, I, like looking back on it, then I really believed that. And I wasn't sure about anything else. I just knew that this is where I needed to be. So, you know, that, that relationship lasted, I can't remember exactly, maybe a couple of years, let's say of like breaking up, getting back together and me living in, in her home to the point where I was like working at a grocery store. I was just doing whatever I needed to, to make some money, you know, to help our relationship and for help, help our success. And, you know, over time, it definitely became more, more and more abusive. It came, you know, a lot, a lot of struggles kind of came out of that. A lot of things I was doing, like, oh man, I, I would, I would sneak out of her house with her. I would sneak back into my parents' house and I would try to get money out of my parents. Like they were sleeping. I would sneak in, basically steal money from my parents, credit cards, things that I could go and sell, right? Just so I could have money to give back to her so we could go and buy things and we can and we can like buy food or even like cannabis, like just different things like that. And over time, like... I started feeling in the back of my mind that something was obviously off here, right? Like I wasn't, this isn't the life that I really wanted for myself. And like, but I was so confused and I didn't know the direction I needed to go. So what happened is we just caused a lot of friction in that relationship to the point where I don't say it ever got violent, but it got like a lot of anger would come up and a lot of arguments and stuff. And her parents would start getting involved anyway. So it basically got to the point where, you know, we, we had to end it. You know, and basically she ended it. I'll be fully transparent. And then I had to leave that house. So here I am, packed up all my stuff in a garbage bag, whatever that she would let me take, a lot of stuff, like I had to leave there, basically. I wasn't even allowed to take it. And I was at the point too where, you know, I was so lost that I was like, I, I would, if she would go out, like say she would go out for the evening with friends or go to a nightclub or whatever. I would stay in the house. I would stay in this room in the basement. I wasn't even allowed in the main room kind of thing. But what gets me, even as I share the story with you is like, when I look back on this, like question is like, how, how could I even allow that stuff to happen to me? Like what place was I at mentally and emotionally that I would allow that kind of stuff to happen to me. And when I look back in the moment, I didn't, it's like, I didn't even care. It's like, I, I, I had no self-worth and, and value so anyway, we got to a point where I had to leave and the relationship had to end. So I ended up packing up my stuff and I left. I remember just walking. I had this garbage bag and I'm walking down the street and I ended up at a gas station. I didn't know what to do. So I asked, I asked the guy if I could use the, the washroom and he let me in. And I ended up just going to this bathroom in a gas station and I just stayed in there. I didn't know where to go. I, my plan was to sleep in the washroom. Cause I, I I couldn't go home at that point. I already like burnt that bridge so many times. <clears throat> and I, again, I was just lost and I was stuck. And, you know, so I finally had to come out of that washroom. The guy came and was knocking on the door and he realized I was in there for a while. So luckily um, I, I called one of my older brothers. I told him what was going on. He obviously knew the situation and he was nice enough to take me in. He was living on his own in his apartment. I ended up going to stay with him for a while until eventually I ended up going back home. And after I got back home, again, I was so lost that, you know, I had no sense of who I was and like what I was going through. And I had a lot of fear that was instilled in me from that relationship. Like I was to the point where I was like, I was scared to open up my closet. I was scared someone was going to come for me. It like created this like sense that I couldn't trust myself and the people around me. At the same time, I'm back home. You know, my parents, again, they were nice enough and they loved me enough to take me back in, but it still was like back in that environment right after all that stuff I just went through. And now I'm here I am. Here I am back home, you know, with my parents again. And one of my brothers was still living at home. So what happened after that? A friend of mine, one of my best friends that I was uh, friends with when I was a kid, he showed up out of nowhere, knocked on my parents' door. It was just like, yeah, I was in the area. I just wanted to see if Jeremy was around. And he had no idea. I, I haven't talked to this guy in years at this point. So he comes into my life and I'm like, yeah, man, I was telling him what was going on. And it was like, it was just so interesting to me because here I am kind of lost, disconnected from everyone else. And out of nowhere, you know, this best friend of mine when I was a kid just shows up. So we started reconnecting 
So at first I thought that was a good thing, right? To have someone in my corner, have someone in my life again. And it was at first, but he was going through his own stuff and he was into drugs, right? So as, as you know, kind of a normal thing sometimes when you're going through hard times, you turn to drugs and other things. So because he was already into it, I was integrated now into his world, right? So not having any real sense self, sense of self, I'm now integrated into his world. I'm like, okay, maybe I should be doing drugs. So next thing you know, you know, we're doing cocaine. We got into heroin. We're smoking that. And this was this was what I was doing day to day for months and months and months. Probably about nine months, I think, is how long I was like um, doing these drugs and, and kind of hanging out with him and stuff. And you know, throughout that period, again, I was I, I wasn't sure on the path that I should be on. So I thought drugs were the answer and they were helping me feel good. Like, especially like smoking heroin. It was like, it was like this sense of relief every time I would do it. It's like, oh, and I can block everything out. But after a while, like, it becomes very addicting. Like I'm literally smoking this stuff in my room, in my parents' house while they're downstairs. And I can remember you know, this one night, it was New Year's Eve, and I went downtown to meet him. He was working at the Air Canada Center, and it was like a tragically hip concert or something there. And um, so I go down there to meet him. I snuck in, actually. I got to see some of the concert. And afterwards, we ate a bunch of mushrooms, and then we were also uh, smoking some heroin. The combination of those two really hit me hard. And I remember we were traveling back on the subway, and we are sitting on there, and I remember like just having this moment of looking around and kind of passing out and waking up and something was like a voice or whatever it was, was telling me that something was so off here and this was not the correct path for me. And this was not where I was supposed to be, you know, and these drugs are highly addictive drugs, but I was able to like, after that night, I remember coming back home and I remember telling myself that like, this is not for me. This is not the path I'm supposed to be on. And just like that, I was like, poof, it was like, I was done with those things. Like, and just as a comparison, you know, sharing this with my friend at the time, he wasn't able to come off those things. He was so highly addicted to them that like, if he would go off one, he would be back on the other kind of stuff. So luckily for me, for whatever reason, I was able to just stop like cold turkey. I never went back to either of those drugs. I never had any calling to. So great. So finally... Now, maybe I'm getting my head a little bit more clear. Things are going a little bit, you know, a little bit better. I'm trying to find my path. And then, you know, my great grandmother, she was in the hospital. And I went to go visit her. And when I'm going to visit her, everything was fine. I visited with her. And on my way back, I'm driving my car. And I was coming up to an intersection. And when I went through this, or sorry, I was coming up to an intersection and the light, I thought in my mind it was green, right? And, and then so I, I was driving through, but in reality, the light was yellow turning red. And so it, it was red or by the time when I should have stopped, I went right through the red light and I hit this other car, like kind of, I think it's the correct term was like T-bone them or whatever it is. Like I hit, the, hit her right on the side. She was driving a van. I was in a Jeep. I remember hitting it. I looked in the rear view mirror to see what color the light was. I don't know. That was my first instinct. Did I just run literally a red light and just hit this car? And I looked at it and the light was red and I was like in shock, right? Because I hit the car pretty hard. Her car kind of spun out. Mine kind of spun out. I just remember getting out of the car. I was like in this crazy, in this crazy shock. And I went over and I just looked at her like through the driver's side window. And she was just like lying there like this. And then the, I knew in that moment that she, she was like done, right? That she passed away. She basically died. And I remember sitting on the curb just like, oh my God, what's happening here? People were starting to come up to me. The police eventually came and stuff. And she did. She passed away on the way to the hospital. Mm. And at that moment, I was like, what is like, so all these things are building up in my life. And I'm like, how the, like, how did I get here? Right? Like what happened that I ended up like traumatic experience after traumatic experience. And I'm like, it just hit me really, really hard. And the crazy fact about that situation is that her husband died in a car accident um, a couple of years prior in the same intersection. Oh my so like at that point I, I had no connection with spirituality or what happened. But to this day, when I look back on it, it's almost like something took over me. Right. 
And like, I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't drinking. I was completely sober. Like, like I, I wasn't a bad driver. Like it made no sense to me. How, how did I even run this red light? And it was, and it was like, for a moment, it was like, I couldn't even remember anything. So you can think about that as you will, like if, what that means. But so, th- so from there, you know, after that moment, I was like, okay, so then I have to deal with this now. I have to go to court. I have to deal with their family. You know, luckily I wasn't really charged. I think they just gave me careless driving, but it was, it was a very hard time, like going to court and facing the family and hearing them share these stories about how I'm this terrible person, right? It was just another catalyst, I guess, into what I was already going through and the deep, darker hole that I was putting myself into. So after that, you know, I'm still living at my parents' house and then end up getting into another relationship with a girl who like lived on my street. Um, and she was a number of years younger than me and stuff like that. We became friends, then we became got into a relationship. And looking back on it now, I realized I was using that relationship as, as another kind of way of not dealing with everything that was going on in my life. And, you know, that relationship had its ups and downs. But during that time, you know, I started getting myself a little bit back together. I went to school, International Academy of Design. I, I took a digital media course where I finally got something that I was really like, you know, interested in. I really like being creative. And I, this was this is when like um, digital media was very, very new. So I was like, okay, this is something that I can sink my teeth into, if you will. I was really kind of into it. So I was taking that course. I was dating this girl. Eventually that our relationship kind of ended. And not 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 in, in, in a positive way either. There was like things happening, like you know, with um, kind of my best friend at the time and her, and like th- things just like people were lying to me, right? People weren't being truthful. I was being hurt. And again, I'm at my parents' house and I'm dealing with them. It was, it was just all this, all this kind of stuff all happening to me at once, and I was just like. I was just in a bad place. I didn't know what to do or how to get out of it. Luckily, I was going to this school and it was like this one place whenever I could go to and I could go there 24 hours a day. Sometimes I stayed there overnight. I, I could just, it was an escape for me, right? And I was learning something I was really into. So finally, I graduated from that. Finally, that relationship ended. It didn't end in a big way. But at that point after school, I ended up kind of starting my own business as a like a design agency, if you will. And I had a business partner. and you know, I had an opportunity to move to uh, to Whistler. And a friend of mine, his friend was already living there in a house and the apartment in the basement opened up. And I don't, for whatever reason, they, they thought I would be a good fit. I didn't really even know this person. But when the opportunity came up, I was running my own business. The relationship kind of fizzled out. And I was like, hell yeah, like I'm out of here. I thought if I went there, it would solve all my problems, right? I was going to move to a different place, have this different life. And it was complete opposite, right? So I get there. Luckily, I, like the business side of stuff it was going well. And again, I could I could really submerge, submerge myself into it because I love designing. I love being creative. I was getting good clients. I was making money. Here I am now living in Whistler. So I was snowboarding a lot. At that point, I was kind of learning how to snowboard. I was living on my own with my dog. Now things on the outside look looked okay right like to to you know maybe my parents and you know the people around me and stuff but on the inside i was like broken right but i was i was taught from a very young age to suppress that and, and to keep that stuff inside of us don't deal with your emotions and your feelings everything's going to be okay well it was not okay right like i was just going through all this stuff and it was it was an interesting time, and luckily enough, I I was able to kind of identify that something something was off, right? Like like I wasn't myself, and I was going through these experiences and stuff. So eventually, you know, I lived in Whistler at that time for a few years. Uh, moved to Vancouver, went back to Whistler. I don't know, two three years or whatever, and um, it got to a point where my my business kind of fizzled out. I was like, okay, maybe I should head back home. So I head back home and I moved back to Toronto. And at this point, everything that I went through was so suppressed down inside of me. It was like I never even went through it. I never even dealt with it, right? So I come back home, start up a new business, you know, another design agency, just like working for myself, getting clients and stuff. Everything is going okay. Like I ended up partnering up with another business and they had they, they we got a house downtown, which we're running the business out of. And I ended up just living in the loft upstairs, 
right? So I was, I was getting my life back on track. I was like hanging out with friends. I was going to parties. I was meeting girls. I was like, I was designing. I was like, everything seemed okay. But again, I, I always go back to this. And the reality is it was like inside of me though, it was like something was so off. And I always felt like I should be doing something else. Or like there was always a call to kind of like, I don't know, like go on a different path. Like something was just always off. But because I was doing well at these things, like designing and making money, I was like, ah, that's nothing. Like, let's just focus on this path. So at this point, I'm trying to remember, maybe it was like 2008 or so. And I'm just like, again, living downtown, living in this house. And it got to a certain point where I'm trying to remember if I met at that point, if I met Krista, my wife right now. And I think, I don't think I actually had met her yet. Anyways, it's not so relevant to, to the timeline, but when I was living in that house, eventually I kind of split from that company that we partnered with and I stayed in the house. Uh, and I kind of took the house over and then I brought in Mark, who you brought up earlier, and then my other friend, Natalia. So they were kind of living in the house with me. So again, it, it was like, we it was having fun. It was like, everything was okay. And I remember she she had the opportunity to go to Brazil and we, we were kind of in, in this like, you know, where we just discovered ayahuasca or she just discovered it and she was telling us about it. And then she was like, yeah, I have this opportunity for us to go to Brazil. Do you want to go and maybe try to find it? And maybe we'll do it. Maybe we won't or whatever. So that was the first what year was this. What year was this roughly? This is like 2008. Um, and, or maybe even a little bit later, 2009. And so I started looking into it too. We were watching documentaries on it. And we were super interested. So I'm like, I was like, okay, I saved some money. Oh, I was, I was dating Krista at the time. I was like, do you want to go to Brazil with Nat? And this other, and her boyfriend at the time, she was into it. So she quit her job. And the four of us, boom, we go to Brazil. And we had an amazing time, amazing adventure. Ended up going to the Amazon, traveling down the Amazon River for like days, trying to meet this tribe, trying to find ayahuasca. And like, at the end of it, we never... We never, we never went in far enough into the jungle, I guess. People were kind of scared and we turned back. So I never actually got to, to you know, get that far, like finding ayahuasca and you know, going on that experience. So after that, we came back and I moved back to, to Whistler with Krista. And again, everything on the outside seemed okay. You know, I, I had another job at that point. Krista and I were living in Whistler. You know, she got a job and everything seemed okay on the outside, but on the inside, I keep saying this because like, I, I just looking back on it, I remember how, like how off I was, but I never wanted to deal with it. And it, it was like, and I would have these jobs and I remember even telling my boss at the time, I was like, man, I just like, feel like I'm called to do something else. Like, like I can do my job well, I'm into it, but I, I feel like, like, I don't, I don't know what it was. It was always this kind of calling or, or that like I should be doing literally something else. And here I am, I was working at the time as a creative director for like an e-learning company in San Francisco. And it, again, everything was going well. We ended up moving from Whistler to Vancouver. I still had that job. Um, no, I ended up leaving that job and taking another job because it paid me more money. So I was like, oh, more money. Great. Amazing. That'll equal happiness. And it didn't equal happiness. It ended up causing more problems in my life. And it wasn't until like we were living in Vancouver at this time. I had my, um, we decided to have our, our first child, Chloe. And, you know, when she was born, one of the happiest moments of my life, obviously. And I remember bringing her home. And then over time, I could see like this version of me coming out, like as a parent that I wasn't aligned with. And it, it came a lot from like, from, from when I was a kid and how my, how I was raised. And there was a lot of anger coming out and it was certain nights where it was like, she was crying in the crib and I'm like, you know, sleepless nights. And I remember getting really angry and frustrating. And there were certain instances where I couldn't control myself. And a lot of things were coming out that I didn't like. And, and, and I could recognize that this wasn't a version of me that I wanted to share with her. And I could also recognize that like I needed to do something about it. Otherwise I was going to fall in the same footsteps as to what I went through when I was a kid and my dad wasn't able to control his emotions. And there was a lot of anger and yelling and fighting and all this kind of stuff that I was, you know, experienced when, when I was a kid. And I was like, I didn't want that to happen to me. I knew that something had to give. And I wasn't sure though. I wasn't sure what it was. I wasn't really into self-development or spirituality. I didn't know what that looked like. 
So the beautiful thing is there was this festival, right, called Burning Man. So one of my friends, one of my best friends, Monty, he he was traveling and he was like, Jared, I, I think I want to go to Burning Man. I was like, can you can you try to get me tickets because I'm traveling? And I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. And it's really like, you know, challenging to get Burning Man tickets. It's like a, it's like a lottery, or food, mm-hmm. right? So, but I was able to get those tickets. So you get two tickets. And I was in this transitional phase where I was like, we were going to leave Vancouver and pack to Toronto. And I was like, maybe I should go to Burning Man with him because like Krista could go visit her parents with Chloe. She could fly back. And Krista was like, yeah, if you want to go, go for it. So it's like, you know what? I've always wanted to go. You know, I was into like, I love dancing. I love electronic music. I looked into the festival. It seemed amazing. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. So, so we pack up all our stuff and we left it in Vancouver. She flew with Chloe back home. I left all my stuff in my apartment because my plan was to go to Burning Man, come back to Vancouver, get my dog and my stuff, and then drive my car <laughs> from Vancouver to Toronto. So that's what I ended up doing. But when I went to Burning Man, that's where I feel like all this stuff kind of like started for me because like when I went there, I saw this whole other way of living right? And all these other people that were so open that wanted to communicate with you, not for any other reason, just for, you know, just for communicating and like love, literally love and just being there with people and stuff. And it was like the first few days, it was very overwhelming and I was very standoffish. And I was like, you know, people wanted to to like talk to me and they just wanted to embrace you. And like, it was, at first it was a lot, but after a few days, I opened myself up to it. And like, I had an amazing experience there. And, and it was also, I should mention, um, cause at night everything comes alive, right? Like, I think you've been there, all the LED lights, you're in your costumes, you're driving your bike in, in, in the desert and the music and the parties. And like, it was so amazing. But during the day, there was all these workshops and I wasn't really anticipating how these workshops would, anticipate, would uh, impact me. And I remember one workshop in particular, it was like, a kundalini uh, style yoga and like some breath work and stuff like that and i loved it i loved the breathing aspect of it. i loved how it made me feel and it really kind of like you know i kind of took to it if you will anyway so after burning man come back get my car get my dog get my stuff drive back to toronto and i was on this high right i was like oh my god like what did i just experience like how is this going to impact my life And then when I finally got back to Toronto, we ended up finding a place to live kind of like midtownish. And, you know, I thought everything was going to change. I thought like everything was going to be better at that point, but it was complete opposite. I actually got more depressed. I got more lost. I ended up losing the job um, that I had prior to that. And so now I had no job. We're, we're, We're transitioning back to, you know, back to Toronto. And I really, personally, I didn't actually want to leave BC. I did it because we wanted to be closer to our family. So, you know, I was trying to figure stuff out again. I just had this amazing experience at Burning Man, but I was in a really, really dark place. And I didn't know, like, should I get a job? Should I start another agency or whatever? But I knew that I was like, had all these emotions and stuff that were coming up. And I knew that I didn't want to have this path where I was going to be a parent that was like yelling at his kids and using fear to control them. and having a lot of anger within me. So I knew that as well. And I ended up getting invited to this mastermind group. And in that mastermind group, it was like 12 of us or whatever. It was like, and it was like new to a lot of us, but it was like, it was my first introductory into self-development. And in that mastermind group, I learned like meditation. I learned how to like, just be vulnerable and talk about the things that I was going through and not keep them suppressed inside of me. I learned the power of just like, you know, supporting others. I learned also that like, I'm not in this alone. A lot of the other people in the mastermind group were going through stuff as well. So those stories or whatever, it was was a real kind of catalyst for me um, and like an introductory into, I I don't kind of spirituality, but not really as much more on self-development, I would say. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, I was able to start having these breakthroughs because I was able to kind of share what was going on with me. And a lot of it was just kind of like talking it out and letting it out of myself and like, having other people support me and, and kind of listen. So that that was was a big part of like, I guess, where my journey began. And eventually we ended up having our, our second child, Harrison, when we were living in that place, uh, kind of midtown. And, uh, you know, at that point, I, I really 
you know, I was coming into my own a little bit. Like I started, I ended up starting um, another agency or another company called Thrive Online, which I'm still running today. And things were getting better because I was opening up more. I, I had conversations with my parents, right? About like stuff that I went through. I apologized to people. I did those things that they suggest you do. I wrote letters to myself and to other people. Like I went through the right things. I started doing the work, I guess is the best way I can put it. And I started evolving. I started growing and I started creating this company and I started getting clients. Eventually we moved from there. We moved down to uh, Richmond Hill. We got like a bigger house. We had two kids at that point. My business was doing well. I was getting clients. I was really just like, I think tapping into my, my true self a little bit more, putting myself out there more. And I really wanted to, to go deeper, right? I wanted to like learn more about these modalities that I was kind of working with. And similar to yourself, I, I discovered Wim Hof. When I discovered Wim Hof, I was like, holy shit, this guy is like the Iceman. He's going into this like, you know, cold water and stuff. And he's utilizing breath work and stuff. I was like, this is fascinating to me. So it started with the breathing. Um, I started like doing his, I got his app. I was doing the breath work and stuff like that. I was realizing this is having a great impact on me and like how I can almost like change my state. But it wasn't until... I would say, I think it was 2021, New Year's, uh, December 31st, 2020, I believe. I was taking a hike around Bond Lake and it was frozen. And I remember seeing these guys going into a hole, right? And I was like, oh my God, these guys are doing cold exposure and stuff. So I walk around and I see the hole. At this point, they're gone. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to come back tomorrow. I'm going to bring Krista. I'm going to bring my kids. New Year's Day. We're going to come back and, we're, and I'm going to do this. So that's exactly what I did. And I remember coming back and showing it to Krista. And she was like, I don't know if you should actually go in the hole. There was no one there to spot me. You know, she was about 10, 15 feet away. She had the kids and my kids were so young at that point. She couldn't like, just like leave them and help. So here I am standing in front of this hole and the, the lake is frozen, just to get context. And there's a hole here and I'm like, man, I got to do this. And I stripped down and I was like, oh, fuck, I can't do this. And I was like, and then I was like, got dressed and I was, I was about to walk away. And I was, and this voice was like, you came here to face your fears, to get out of your comfort zone. And you can set your whole tone for the rest of the, for, for this new year, right? It was a new year. This is how you're going to do this. And I was like, fuck it. I got to do it. So I stripped down again and I actually got in the hole. I don't know how long, I wasn't there for long, but like it, it just set the tone for basically that the rest of that year. Cause I was like, man, yeah, I don't want to live on the uh, like on the other side of fear anymore because I was scared to do all these things because of all these past experiences that have happened to me I wasn't I wasn't trusting myself I wasn't able to trust the people around me yeah I was running a business but I was scared to, to create videos and put them out there I was I was scared to put myself out there if I could hide behind the business and get clients that was working for me but it was only getting me so far and I knew that certain things I was limiting myself because of all these things that were holding me back. So I got in the hole and, and it was like, poof, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. I was like on oh, this high, right? And so I started getting, so I started going on my own. I started going to, to Bond Lake and uh, on, not even realizing if I would have waited a couple of hours, other people were going as well. And I was like, I, I want to learn more about this. So I started going online and I was like, where can I find a meditation? No, I was looking for a meditation studio that was like integrated with cannabis. At the time, I, I was like using cannabis quite a bit, actually, not from a spiritual, like meditative way. I was using it as a vice as to like, you know, escape from reality. And it was that cannabis was actually the one thing throughout all these years and all these stories that I'm sharing. I was always cannabis. Cannabis was there for me. So anyway, so I, wa I wanted to get more into meditation and I wanted to see if there was a cannabis meditation thing. So I, I Google it and then... I found the studio Elemental Wellness that was, and I don't even know if you were offering it, but it was like in the description. So I guess that's why it came up, but you weren't able to smoke in there. I remember you saying, no, we can't smoke in here. You had to go outside. But regardless, right, it brought me to Elemental Wellness, Elemental Wellness and obviously meeting you. So I was like, holy shit. Now there's this studio where the, there was like float tanks and you're offering meditation and you were doing Wim Hof. And I was like, okay. So my, my, my journey just keeps evolving, right? It keeps taking me on this path. And I'm like, okay. So then I started coming to the studio more. Um, I did the Wim Hof workshop with you. And I, and I was doing more. You didn't have ice. I don't think you had ice. You're doing ice baths outside. You didn't have them inside the studio. 
But then eventually you started offering the breathwork classes, which is now the elemental rhythm breathwork classes. And, you know, I'm so happy that I ended up going to that first class because I was like, what is this? Right. But I was like, at that point, I was so into all this stuff. It was so like pulled to it, like the meditation, the breath work, the cold exposure, working on myself. Like it was almost like I went through all that stuff so I could find this other stuff so that I can learn all these modalities and stuff. So I ended up doing my first elemental rhythm breakthrough class. And I remember how like I was just like, what the fuck? Okay, like what what is this, right? Like it had such an impact on me. And the first couple of classes, it was like, am I breathing correctly? Like you're in your head, right? I remember being in my head. I remember some of the stuff you said, how important it is to let go and get out of your head, right? Get into your body. And I can't remember what class it was, maybe the third time I did it, fourth, I don't know, but I had this experience where it was like, again, it was like out of body, like totally like like elevated above myself to see myself lying there, like shaking the vibrating, the energy or whatever, and just getting so emotional and recognizing that like all this stuff that, that I've kind of been through, right. Doesn't define who I am. They're just kind of experiences. And, and I have the ability now to kind of work through that stuff and to reconnect with myself and to go in another direction. So I kept going to these classes. I kept having these breakthroughs and what would started as really sad seeing myself as a little boy. Oh, one really, I think, important thing is like part of this, the breakthrough experience is like um, like seeing yourself as a younger version. And I, in the first few times, I kept going back to when I was like 19, when I, when I met this woman and I went through these relationships, almost like I was like forcing myself to go to that time. But I remember there was one experience where I went back to when I was a little boy, maybe like seven, eight years old, and I remember seeing myself like, like when I was a little kid, I, I ran away from home, which I ran into my backyard. I was sitting under a tree with a little bag. And I went to that moment. And it was in that moment I realized that that the stuff that I really needed to heal wasn't when I was in that time from when I was 19. It was from when I was a little kid. And when I started going into back to, to that and I started go, having those breakthroughs and dealing with those emotions and then having conversations with my parents, that's when things really shifted for me and when I started going to these breakthrough classes it went from me being sad and crying having these like emotions to me being really happy and energetic and feeling alive and I was hooked like the breath work I could see was a huge tool that you can use to change your state and also you know release trauma and release these experiences and face them and stuff and then after the the sessions you know we would have a sharing circle so I was able to share people I didn't know, but then I was also listening to other people share. And again, like I personally believe being in an environment like that and hearing other people's stories is a real therapeutic experience because you can really connect with other people and realize that like we're all going through something. It's not just you. So for me, that that was really, really beneficial. So to fast forward then, you know, I was coming to Elemental Wellness. I was going through this stuff. And then like you said, well, no, I think COVID came around that time, I guess, and we couldn't go to the studio anymore. I ended up moving away where I live now, which is a small town. I live out in the country, about an hour west of Ottawa. And you you were building, sorry, the Elemental Rhythm Facilitator Training Program. That's correct. And at that point, I was like, I, I was hearing about it. I knew you were doing it. And again, I felt this kind of call to do it. And I was trying to help you, I think, with your elemental wellness business. So anyway, we, we worked something out where you, you let me take the facilitator training. And, uh, you know, and then and it did. And I, and I took it. And after taking that training, you know, I still wasn't fully connected with myself and realizing that this could, this could be me. Like I could actually facilitate. I was still in my head thinking, oh, I'm not a spiritual person. I'm not geo. I'm not this person. Like... You know, who am I to be able to go out and facilitate this stuff? So even after taking the training, I was still practicing breath work on my own, but I wasn't doing the training for other people. I wasn't facilitating. It took me a good year to finally realize that, yeah, actually, you know, this is something what I do. I just, you know, I got to get out of my comfort zone. And, you know, during that year, I was really submerging myself in these modalities, like cold exposure and breath work. You know, I built a nice bath in my garage. Like I set myself up for success so I could heal myself and I continue using the modalities. So finally I decided, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to start facilitating again. I found some places in my area that were open to it and it was really well received because there was nothing like that kind of where I'm at. 
uh, sorry, the, like the community that, that I'm within. So people were really open to it and they were having breakthroughs there. And it was like, oh man, I'm like, I can do this. This can be part of who I am. So I started facilitating that. And then we ended up um, connecting in the sense that like I was going to come uh, and, and I was looking, sorry, this was like my business at the point, Thrive Online, it was doing okay, but it wasn't like fulfilling me. Like I knew something was off and COVID kind of like shifted the business. I didn't have as many clients. And then you were looking for someone to kind of help out with project management, elemental rhythm. And then through Mark, he was like, Jer, why don't you talk to Gio? And he was like, Gio, why don't you talk to Jer? So we connected and then it was like, boom, let's try this out. It was good overlap. I could bring a lot of my marketing, branding and website experience and help you with project management. And then as soon as we started working together, I feel like it just kind of like took off from there, right? I was like integrated now. It was like all my my experiences, all my journey, everything that I've been through, I'm finally doing something that I feel fulfilled, right? And it's not just on the design side, but now I'm actually integrating myself into like this breathwork business, this wellness business. I'm helping other people. I started realizing that that is, is my calling. Like I, I really want to help and support people and hold space for them. And I, I didn't mention, but over like the last couple of years, I was doing that stuff on the side. I had workshops in, in my house. You know, I did this thing of 30 days of support where for 30 days, I reached out to a different person um, offering them my support. I was like, if you need anything, just let me know. Some people were open to it. Most people were not, but these were things that I was doing just as because I felt called to do it, but I was, it wasn't my focus. So finally I started working with you and helping you build this business. And through that, you know, and this is because this is where it comes, I think, really cool. It was like you invited me to go with you to Rhythmia. And can so, tell, like, can we tell the story of the Rhythmia story? Yeah. Well, hold on, yeah, let, let me just mm-hmm. pop it at, or get to this point because what I find it's interesting is like I first was presented with ayahuasca in like 2008, and now we're talking like 2023. I think 15 years later, and throughout the years, it's always presented to myself and I've done work with uh, psilocybin kind of more recreationally, I guess. But it was like, when I entered this community of, you know, elemental wellness and elemental rhythm, a lot of the people, like even like you were running a men's group and I integrated myself into the men's group. Like I was doing everything that I could get my hands on to help myself heal. I was all in. I, I didn't want to live a life I was living before fear and depressed and sadness and feeling sorry for myself. But I remember in, in the men's group, especially, it's like everybody was has done it. Everyone, I was the minority, right? Like most people worked with ayahuasca or some type of, of plant medicine. So it was like, it, it was like, it, like they say, you have that calling, right? You'll get the calling to go and work with this kind of medicine. So it was, it was like calling me and calling me, but it was still like that fear of like going to work with it. Do I need it? Can I, I was telling myself, I don't need to do that. I'm good. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm already like healed and stuff, which is probably the farthest thing from the truth. And then you decided, um, so, so you were facilitating elemental rhythm at Rhythmia. It's something that's integrated into the retreat there. And so when you go a few times a year, you're able to bring a guest with you, right? And and you were like, this time, it was like, okay, so, so you invited me. So it was like, I didn't have to pay for anything. Like all I had to do is basically show up and everything was like turnkey. It was like, just show up, go there. And like, you're in like a five-star resort, ayahuasca, like university with workshops and all this stuff. And I get to go through four ceremonies. So I talked to Krista and she was like, look, if you want to go and do this, I'll I'll support you. But I was like, oh, but like in my head, I was like, I don't think I should leave the kids. I I was finding reasons not to go till I was like, you know what? I'm just going to tell Gio I'm going. Because if I tell you I'm going and I commit to it, like I could back out, but I'm not the type of person that's going to commit to something and, and like give you my word on it. And then I'm going to pull out. So I knew it was like, just take the baby steps. First step is to tell Gio you're in, figure everything out. And then, yeah. And then I ended up going and going on that, on that experience with you. So Jeremy tells me he's coming and I can see this kind of like apprehension, you know, like he wants to be there, but like, there's this friction of like, he's coming, he's not coming. The flights aren't working, then it's working. And so eventually we get them there on, on time. And first day we do an ice bath and do the breath work, the workshop. He spends a lot longer in the ice bath than he probably should have. Or fasting because we're getting ready for ceremony on a Monday night. I remember before going back to his room, I seemed kind of like shivering a bit. I'm like, you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm good. Uh, but I think he overdid it a little bit. 
And we go into the first night. And the whole time there, I could see he's like really in his head a lot. He's like asking questions, people are sharing. And he's kind of like, you could tell like something is kind of like, there's something there that he's like kind of just stuck in his mind. Yeah, you're about to do uh, ayahuasca. That, that's what was stuck in my head. Yeah, yeah. And so like, you know, not knowing what to expect. And so the first night, I drink the first cup. I go lay down and I, I fall asleep and I'm awakened by this big like thunk sound, like boom. And I'm like, oh, please don't be Jeremy. I'm like beside my other friend, like, hey, did you see who that was? Like, no. And I turn back, a little group of people around someone. All I see is Jeremy's white tank top with the white line. I know it's him. I'm like, shit. So I get up, I go check. He's kind of dazed. He just passed out. He comes to, and he's just like, what happened? It's all confused. He's sweating. And I'm like, damn. And in that moment, they gave him some, like, some sugar water or something because um, he had a sugar drop. And I, I went back to my mat. He went back to his mat. I realized that overdoing it in the ice bath, it was like, like using up all of his sugar to create heat. And then the ayahuasca can also do the same thing. So the com combination of the two just made him have like, like, like a crazy experience for your first night, probably right in your head. And then he's just like, what the hell? And what he shared with me after at the end of that night was, man, it's not what I thought. It's so hard. I was sitting there contemplating leaving. Like I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm booking my flight. Like all these reasons justifying why. But then he shared. And then I noticed as I was in my head doing this thing I do all the time, something was there looking at me. And it was looking at me and just watching me. And it made me realize that it was watching me. And it was kind of like saying like, hey, like, you're not going anywhere. You know, I'm here, like something is here. And he felt that. And although he was still apprehensive, something got him to stay. And the one thing I, I never want to do is make anyone feel like they're forced to stay. So we go through the whole next day and he's kind of like, again, unsure, but he's willing to give it. He's there, he's willing to go again. You know, it was a hard night. We get to the second ceremony and the second ceremony there was crazy. Like it's really strong medicine. It was a complete people freaking out, a lot of screaming, throwing up, a lot of emotions. And I think like Jeremy's a bit empathic and he was feeling all this from everyone. And he only took one cup. And I remember halfway through the night, I see him up at the front, I'm like, okay, he's having a good time. He's in the action. And he's like, hey, I'm going. And I'm like, what do you mean you're going? Yeah, I'm going back to, to my room. And I'm like, he's like, yeah, I'm fine. I talked to them. They said, it's no problem. I'm going. And I just want to go back and lie down. I'm like, what is going on? I'm okay, let me go talk to him before he goes. So I rush out, I find it, I catch him and we sit down uh, on a bench kind of a little bit away from, from the action. And he's sharing with me. He's like, you know, I did it. I came here. I want to experience ayahuasca. I got everything I needed out of it. And I, I'm good. Like I, I got what I needed. And I could see in his face, like there was still something that was like blocked that he hadn't got there yet. Um, but he felt that I didn't want to deny his feelings either. And I'm like, okay, like, if, if you're sure that's what you want, like, let, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to force, let's just chat tomorrow. And I want to make sure it was okay. And I think over the next 24 hours, like a lot of stuff started coming up for you. That's what you kind of shared. It was like all this stuff started coming up. I mean, you can speak to a little bit um, what was coming up for you, but all of your stuff was like coming up, this trust, this not being able to kind of let go. And Well, it, it's interesting. Cause like, like you said, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I got enough out of it. And that was like, before I even went there, that's what I was telling myself that, oh, I'm good. I, I don't need plant medicine. I, I can do this on my own. And when, like you said, I'm definitely empathetic and I was feeling all the energy in that room. And when I was looking around and like, it was so intense, I, I guess, like you said, the medicine was very strong that night. And I was like, everyone was like zombies almost. And people were like purging and this and that. So I was like, okay, I'll just go outside. So I ended up just chilling in a hammock. And then there was another experience I was watching where this other guy was getting worked on. And I was like, I just, I don't know. I felt like I had to get, I had to get out of there. Right. Run so, away. It's to run away again. I had, I couldn't, yeah, I guess I had to run away. I just couldn't handle everything that was happening. And it, it almost like convinced myself that I wasn't on the medicine. And then I convinced them that I was good. The reality was though, when I went back to my room, that's when my experience started. Like I, I remember sitting on my bed thinking, oh, I'm good. I'm just going to crash and go to sleep. And I just looked up and they have these really cool, like psychedelic, um, I don't know, paintings or pictures on the wall. And I looked at it and it was like, like it was just going off. And then the rest of, of that night, I had to like go through this whole kind of back and forth of feeling light and love, but then feeling darkness and sadness and like all these crazy visuals and like the, the light and like almost like this hand reaching down to me. Like I, I'm not going to get into all the things that happened to me, but it was like, 
it was like, okay, here I am. I have to be willing to face this and, and go through this experience. I, I had no choice. I was like in my room, like oh, the only option I had was to leave. And that didn't even cross my mind. So I, I in my mind, I look back. There was on nowhere it. else to go. Where were you going to go after that? You know? Well, so I was like, okay, well, this is when I look back on it now, it was like, cause they say like, you know, each journey is different and they show you what you need. It's like, I don't know, I guess I needed to go back to my room for whatever reason to face these things the way that I needed to face it. It's not like everybody was going back to the room. It was like, it was, no, it was very rare. It's very rare that they let people go back to the room. So I don't know what I said to them, but they, they were open to it. And uh, you had to face it yourself. It felt like you had to trust yourself to like, be able to like go through it and, and not avoid it. It's like, Hey, like I put myself in a place where it's only just me and my experience. And I have to really like go into it and see what it has. And so, so the so next day, like, I think things were coming up for you. You were getting very emotional. You were sharing, you're connecting with other people. You were like, you know, like all these things were happening that was like allowing you, I think from what I got from was like to trust yourself and to trust the process and to trust the ayahuasca. And you came back the next night and I said, okay, now you're coming right in the front with me. You're not hiding in the corner, yeah. you're right in the action. You're sitting beside me and like, that's it. And I was just keeping an eye on you all night. And, and you know, it was the women's night, I think it was more gentle on you when you chose to like trust and just surrender. I remember at one point in the night, seeing you on the dance floor, like I'd never seen you before, like you were just fully like, letting yeah. go completely like liberated, like dancing, jumping, like, and I was like, okay, he got it. Like, this is what yesterday, what he thought he got. And like today, like he got it. Yeah. And, and from there, I've seen nothing but a shift in you, like nothing but a shift in like the way you, your energy is, the way you see things, the belief in yourself, the, the drive and the passion. And, and, and maybe you can talk a bit more about the changes that came after that. But what was clear is like, from that day, you were like, hey, there's a program that we need to make that I want to bring into the world. And, you know, it, it became so clear that this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, most definitely. I, I think the biggest shift happened that night was like, I had this voice in my head saying that I should off myself. And I like when I was going through those dark, dark years, there was moments where I thought, like, I had suicidal thoughts, right? Like, you're depressed, like, that stuff crosses your mind. Obviously, I, I never attempted suicide or anything like that. And as I worked on myself, I got better. But when I went that night, for whatever reason, that voice, like, this voice came telling me that I should off myself. It was like, off yourself. I was like, off myself? Like, what? Why am I thinking this? And then first, and I'm on, on the medicine at this time. And the worst thing you can do, whatever comes up, this is what I learned, is try to push it away because it just gets worse and worse. That's my first instinct. I don't want to think that, think something else, think something else. And then I was like, and I remembered what they were telling us. I was like, no, like keep saying it to myself over and over. And then this other, the same voice was like, now change that word off. Like after I said it to myself, I'm going to off myself. I'm going to off myself. They say, and then this voice was like, change that word off to love. And it was like, I'm going to love myself. I'm going to love myself. And it was like, boom. And it was the most, um, like for me personally, it was one of the most incredible moments of my life. I remember just like feeling, I think I even told you that. And I remember getting up because you were lying next to me and I went outside to the fire and they say that like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they say that the, the fire is the grandfather and we were able, we should go out there and talk to the fire, introduce ourselves to it, tell them who you are, your parents, and then you can release things into it. And I just remember doing that. And I remember, okay, okay, I'm not this anymore. I'm not that anymore. This is gone. This is gone. I was like, boom, 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 boom. And then I sat to the fire and I'm like, and then I looked and I looked to the right and they had the doors open. And I remember seeing Roxy and, and it was, it wasn't, and you were actually, like there was a few of you guys that were just like dancing and music. And I love dancing. I'm very expressive. And it's something that I probably don't do enough, but I was like, I'm, I just came back in there and I was like, almost like striding. And I was just like, I got, that's when you saw me and I was just so free and I was so alive. And I was like, that's how, like, that's how I feel like to, to that, to that day. Like, obviously I don't feel like that all the time, but that's the feeling I keep going back to. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, I've let something go like through that experience. And I was holding on to this version of myself that I was letting Go, sorry, I was like created my, myself over those years to feel safe and to feel comfortable and to be received in the world. It was like I was able to let all of that version of myself go. And now I'm, I'm able to actually truly feel connected, truly show up as I am and not have any fear towards that. Mm -hmm. And that to me has been my biggest shift. And so from there, like explain like what does create a life you love to live mean to you? Like this intention for this project. Right. So, so the notion of that project is actually gone back 
a year or so before all of that kind of happened. And I started, like I said, I, I did like a workshop in my house. I was creating it. I did it. I did a workshop about five times online for free, just like opening it up to people because again, I felt this calling that this is something that I'm supposed to be doing. So I wanted, I was dabbling in it. Right. And a couple of people had some success. Like, like Mark, for example, he was like one of the first people I took through the workshop. And, and he says it's one of the biggest catalysts to his own transformation and stuff. But for whatever reason, you know, like even though I was doing that stuff, I would block myself from actually um, going full in on it, like really, really like dialing this version of myself. Like, no, again, that's not me. I'm still. But then when I worked through with the ayahuasca and, and, and the downloads that I had and the work that I did and like the questions I was asking, it became so clear to me that like the fact that I'm working with you now, the fact that like my whole journey has brought me to these modalities and the way that I'm showing up in my life, it was so crystal clear. So when I came back, it was like, yeah, I really wanted to create something. And what I realized is at first I was like, yeah, I need, I think I should be a coach. Right. And what I realized it's not even about me being a coach. It was more about me creating a container, right. Where people can do that inner work that I went through in a safe place where they can work through their issues and their wounds and their blocks and all that stuff. And we can provide them with the tools and take them through this program that gives them everything they need, set them up for success right? That they can hopefully go through a, a similar transformation and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's like, you have to show up for yourself. We're not, like you always say, we're not doing the work. They have to do the work for themselves, but we can provide them with that safe place. And like, and that's when the notion of like, create a life you, like originally it was like, create a life you love to live. And then we shortened it. But that was the whole premise of it is like, yeah, I want to put that out into the world. And, and not have fear about like, is anyone going to sign up? Who am I to do that? To set the intention that like, yeah, I think the world needs this. I think we can create a safe container for it using the elemental rhythm breath work, using the tools you've already kind of created and setting people up for success. And like, let's see, let's see if this works, but like, we're never going to know unless we try. So yeah, that's how it all kind of came to life. And then the podcast was just about sharing other people's stories of transformation. Cause like you see it, I see it now too. It's like transformation is hundred percent possible. If you think you're stuck and you're going on a certain trajectory and you need to shift, it can be done, but it can't be done unless you're willing to, to one, like take responsibility for your life and two, be willing to see who you've actually become. And they talk about that arrhythmia. And that's something that like was a huge eye opener for me because I thought I did all this work on myself. But when the medicine showed me who I was, who I actually become and the work that I really needed to do, it was a game changer. But I was, I've was i always been willing to do the work because like I said, when I first had my daughter, that was my catalyst. I did not want to continue on the, the journey I was on. And it got to a certain point where it was like, I would do anything not to feel this way anymore. So I, I've been doing the work for seven years now. And I'm not saying I'm, perfect. I'm not saying I'm fully shifted, but I give, I can give myself a pat on the back and feel good about the fact that I put in the work. And that's all it really takes is you stepping up, taking responsibility and doing the work. And, and that's what I hope that we've created. And I hope that, you know, we can take people on those journeys, those transformational journeys. Incredible. And let people know, like, where can they find you? Where, where can they get more information about Create Life You Love to Live? Yeah, so obviously, you know, we're creating this podcast and there'll be lots of episodes following this one. Um, you know, we'll have a, once once the platform is up and running, we'll have a link to how you can access it. Me, myself, you can act, you know, connect with me on Instagram at Jared Fink. Um, you know, definitely check out elementalrhythm.com. You know, we're building amazing programs there with the breath work journeys and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's amazing tools for you in your own transformation. So yeah, I'm not so worried about people connecting with me, but you know, once the podcast is out and stuff, it'll be easy to find like links to the to the website and other resources. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure sharing this conversation with you, although you're so good telling your story. I didn't have to do much except hold space for you. So uh, yeah. really excited about what's to come and and you know how we can kind of what we can create together. Amazing. So listening, everyone, uh, please check out all these podcasts because the stories are inspirational motivational and you're going to hear a lot of like real life situations of people who are continually transforming going through their own process um, so yeah, yeah thanks for listening and we'll see you guys again soon